Welcome everybody. My name is Mina Jane and I am the director of the Ashland Public Library. I'm very happy to be here tonight with Alex Myers, who's going to be talking about his ancestor, Deborah Sampson, someone you might have heard about in the Revolutionary War. And I think that there's a really, there's just so much to unpack in that in, about Deborah, and we can't wait to hear from Alex about her. But before we get to that, I wanted to say a couple of things. One is I'd like to thank the Friends of the Ashland Public Library for supporting all of our adult programming, actually all of our programming, so not just for the adult. And also, Alex was kind enough to let us partner with other local libraries. And, um, you know, I always say that when libraries work together, we make magic. So tonight is a magical evening because we also welcome patrons from Clinton, Wellesley, Watertown, Andover, Wayland, North Reading, Manchester, Raynham, Somerville, Lexington, Newton, and Rockport. And of course, our Ashlanders, who um, I always like to see as well. So anyways, we're going to be talking about Deborah Sampson. Alex Myers and I talked, oh gosh, I was saying we had planned a program in 2020, April of 2020. Of course, the, everybody knows that the world fell apart at that point and um, we weren't able to do it. So I was really thrilled to reconnect with Alex and have him come back and do this program uh, um, at this library with so many of you. So welcome, Alex. Thank you so much for being here. And start just let, let's just start with telling us a little bit about yourself and your book. Fantastic. Thank you um, for inviting me. I'm so delighted to see the names of all these Massachusetts towns. You're going to see a couple of historical mentions of your towns uh, in tonight's talk, so that's exciting too. Um, I am an English teacher. Um, I'm an author, um, and currently I am the director of the Mountain School of Milton Academy up in Berkshire, Vermont. So I'm living the the rural life and. Um, just this morning helped to herd some livestock um, to, to a new pasture. So you never know where life will take you. This is not where I thought I would be, but I'm delighted to be here. Um, and I wrote this novel, Revolutionary. It was my debut novel. It came out in uh, 2014. Um, and it was a piece of historical fiction. And one of the things that was most delightful about writing it was getting to dive into the research. And for anybody in the audience who is an aspiring author, particularly of historical uh, fiction, you'll know that um, it's altogether too easy to get lost in the research and let the writing uh, wait a little bit. So um, one of the pleasures of giving a talk is to get to revisit that research and share um, what I learned about my ancestor. Um, so Alex, can I just interrupt for one second? Sure. Um, so Alex is going to do a presentation for 25 to 30 minutes, and then we'll take questions in the Q&A afterwards. So you can use the chat to chat with each other. Have at it. But um, if you have a question that you would like for me to ask Alex, please put that in the Q&A after his presentation. Thank you. Sorry, go for oh, it. Not a problem. That's great. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen um, just to get started here. And, um, you know, please do think about questions you want to you want to ask. Um, I'm delighted to go off on many tangents um, in whatever directions uh, you want. So, um, as I say, I'm an English teacher. I'm an author. And to me, there is probably no more powerful force in the universe than the power of a good story. I think stories are how we understand ourselves. I think stories are how we understand the world around us and how we make connections between place and person, between uh, possibility and potential, um, and, and how we really realize um, truths that are sometimes hard to access otherwise. Um, I owe my love of stories without question to my mother. Um, she is a fantastic storyteller, and I grew up in rural Maine. And um, for anyone, anybody who else is from rural New England, you know that it takes a long time to get from point A to anywhere else. And so my childhood was a lot of car trips to visit grandma or aunt and uncle or cousins. And wherever we went, uh, my mom would have a story to tell either about the place that we were going to visit people we were going to visit or where we were driving through. And it just helped me forge the sense of connection that I had ancestors who'd lived here, that they'd done interesting things. And they were stories were bizarre and funny. Um, I remember my favorite one, we used to drive six hours north in Maine to a, a beautiful little uh, woodland lake. And my great grandfather and his brother had loved to fish. And they had built a little log cabin on one side of the lake. And they had fished from it um, for a couple summers. And they, they found out much to their disappointment that the fishing was really better on the opposite shore of the lake. And they got tired of paddling over all the time to, to fish over there. So they waited until the ice was really thick one winter on the lake. And they just picked their cabin up, 
pushed it across the ice to the other side of the lake and set it up there. And I just love stories like that. They, they give me a kind of an anchor, a sense of rootedness um, that I belonged to somewhere. And that was a feeling that I often looked for as a child. Um, because as a kid, I was really confused about who I was and, and where and where I belonged. This is a picture of me when I'm four years old. Um, and I always like to start my storytelling uh, with this picture, um, because everything about this picture suggests that I'm a happy little girl. And I was. Um, I was named after my mother's favorite great aunt, my great great aunt Alice. Um, she was a miraculous woman. Um, she owned a dozen cats and they could do tricks. Specifically, if we visited my great great aunt Alice on a Sunday, every cat would be wearing a bow around its neck as its Sunday attire, and every cat had to roll over before being given its Sunday dinner. Nothing short of a miracle. <laughs> I own cats and they won't do any tricks. Um, anyway, I, I start with this picture because you can see at my feet, I've got a present and I'm about to go to a birthday party. And at that birthday party, an adult will ask me a quintessential adult question. What do you want to be when you grow up? And I will say, I want to be a boy. Um, of course, you can imagine that there was a lot of laughter and trying to explain why this was impossible, but this is where my story starts, because on the outside, I look just like a happy little girl, and I am, and on the inside, I'm feeling like I want to be a boy, because I did, and this was my beginning of my love-slash-hate affair with language. Um, language is so powerful, right? The right word opens up doors, but at four years old, I didn't have uh, the right word, uh, boy and girl. Neither one seemed to work to explain what I was feeling. Here I am at six, um, uh, and this is when I realized the right word will do things that are amazing. And for me, the right word in the 1980s, for those of you who lived through it, was tomboy. Um, all around me, uh, there were tomboys on TV, um, there were tomboys in advertisements, and tomboy was a word that was positive. I could go to work with my mom, and the women she worked with would say, oh, I was a tomboy when I was your age. Um, and so it helped me think that there was possibility um, that I could explain myself if I had the right language, the right concepts to say, this is how I feel. And tomboy was such a comfortable word. I could climb trees. I could wear these awesome fashionable overalls, have my hair cut short. I could say to people, yeah, I'm a tomboy. And they immediately said, yeah, I get where you're coming from. Um, tomboy, of course, comes with an expiration date. Little girls who say they're tomboys are expected to grow out of it. Um, and so as I grew up, uh, that word kind of kind of faded away as accessible to me. And I was back to wondering, how am I going to do this? How do I manage to feel one way on the inside and not be able to explain that on the outside? Um, and I, I like this picture because it's a school picture and I was told I had to dress nicely and I clearly have won the battle with my mom over what I'm going to wear. Um, dress nicely to me demand collared shirt. And she always was trying to put me in a dress. Um, and clothing is so important when we talk about gender, historically and, um, and today. What do you feel comfortable wearing? What makes you feel like yourself? Um, and for me, as a, as a little tomboy, I loved my brother's hand-me-down clothes. I did not want to grow up. But it was pretty inevitable um, that I would, of course. Um, and here I am, headed off to boarding school in ninth grade. Um, I was terrified to leave home um, but it turned out to be a wonderful, wonderful experience. I left my small main town. Um, I went to a big boarding school. There were people there who were really profoundly different from me, profoundly different from anything I'd been exposed to. And um, there were people there who were openly gay and lesbian. Um, and this was pretty remarkable for the early 90s. Um, but I was able to, to start to ask questions about who I was and how I wanted to live. Um, and I was able to come out as a lesbian um, and, to, and to say, maybe this is a way that I can explain why I feel different from other girls. It wasn't who I really was, though. And when I got to be the age of 15 and 16, it was pretty difficult. Um, I was growing up. People were having expectations for me. I didn't like those expectations. And I'd run out of ways to explain how I felt, why I was different, and trying to make myself fit in only made me uh, feel more and more frustrated with the world around me. And it was at this point in my life that I can really say stories saved me. I had a wonderful assignment um, when I was in high school, and it was to it was called the Roots Paper, and it was to research an ancestor. Um, and I decided I would research an ancestor that I'd heard about from my grandmother, um, an ancestor of ours uh, named Deborah Sampson. And here is a picture of Deborah Sampson from the 1790s. Um, if you see the family resemblance between us, you can just 
keep it to yourself. Um, and Deborah Sampson was an amazing woman. Um, and the research I'll share now is what I did when I was writing um, my novel, but a lot of it was what I began to uncover when I was writing that paper all those years ago in high school. So Deborah Sampson was born in 1760. Um, in the town of Plimpton, Massachusetts. Didn't see that one come up in the chat. It's not too far from Plymouth, uh, where the famous Mayflower Plymouth Rock landing stuff goes on. Um, and she was one of seven children, um, which was a typical size family for uh, colonial America or the early American Republic. Um, but when Deborah was about four years old, her father abandoned the family. Um, her mom used to say that he'd been lost at sea, but the truth is that uh, he got on board a boat and the boat landed just fine in Maine and he got off it and never came home. Um, so Deborah's mom was left to raise seven children on her own. Um, and it was absolutely financially impossible for her to do that. So she uh, put Deborah out. That was the colonial uh, term for giving your child into service at a young age. And at four years old, Deborah was given to a widow in the town of Plimpton um, and was that woman's servant. Um, she did some carrying and some household cleaning and tasks that the widow couldn't do. Um, the widow uh, was apparently very kind to Deborah, taught her how to read, taught her how to weave, which was a very, turned out to be a very lucrative skill for, for Deborah eventually. And when the widow died at age eight, when Deborah was aged eight, Deborah was old enough to be sold. Um, and at eight, her mother sold her into indentured servitude for a 10 year term of service. Again, this would be a fairly typical early existence for a very poor family in early America. So at eight years old, Deborah was the property of the uh, Thomas family in Middleborough, Massachusetts. Um, she helped with childcare. The Thomases had three boys. Um, she probably helped with household chores of a wide variety. And she uh, was responsible for all the fowl, <laughs> ducks and chickens and geese um, that the household raised. Um, she served those 10 years. And at age 18, so 1778, Deborah would have been expected to uh, do one of a few things when she was freed of her indenture. She would have been expected to marry if she had a sweetheart. She would have been expected to sign on to serve another family um, if she could not get, get a marriage or return home to live with her father. In other words, she was expected to find a new master. Um, and all women had to have a master. Um, they were property. Uh, they could be owned by a family um, and be taken care of by a, a brother or a, a father or a husband, or they could be uh, a servant in a household. But masterless women uh, were, were not a legal category except for widows. Um, and e even they really had a tenuous legal uh, circumstance. But Deborah was a rebel um, in a time that um, kind of honored rebels. So she was at the, at the right moment there. And she petitioned the town of Middleborough to become a masterless woman. And the conditions to do this were to prove that you had no quote unquote easy master. She had no father, that was fine. Um, and that you could support yourself. And Deborah said, I can support myself because I know how to weave. Um, so weaving at the time, um, sometimes we, we think of it as a domestic chore, but it was actually a very public occupation in rural America. Um, you would go to a tavern and weave. Why would you weave in a tavern? Um, because looms were huge. They were the size of a double bed. Um, they were very expensive and you had to be able to fit it in your house. So you had to be super rich to be able to afford a loom and the room to put it in. Much more common was that you would rent a loom at a tavern. And so people would hire Deborah to weave their wool um, into cloth and to weave their flax into linen. She spe specialized in lawn. That is a very fine quality of linen. And so they would, she would often just sit in a tavern in a back room with all the, the looms and the big walking wheels, and she would uh, weave all day. And she could support herself um, in doing that. And this is Sprout Tavern. Uh, Sprout Tavern stood on one of Middleborough's greens for a long time. This is taken in the early 20th century. You can see by then it's rather dilapidated. It was a hugely formative place for Deborah. She says that in, 17, uh, in the 1778 and 1779, she can recall Colonel Ebenezer Sprout returning and standing at that very doorstep and reading aloud the brand new Declaration of Independence and all of Middleborough again gathering and cheering and that she can say that she saw the militia, the town militia march out um, fr from a Spirit Tavern uh, to, to do their service. So a, a massively important place, the one that put her at the corner of men's life, right? Because they would all come to socialize in the tavern. I will say researching this book was a lot of fun. I did a, some road trips and tried to find Spirit Tavern since she mentions it so often. Alas, 
All that is left of Sprout Tavern is this. Um, it is one of the original outhouses from the early 1700s. Um, Middleborough Historical Society has preserved it, which I love. There's a little tiny piece. It's a really unique outhouse too. It's a three seater and one of the cheap seats is child sized um, so that you can go and, and witness this uh, historical uh, presence. <laughs> um, all I could find of, of Sprout Tavern. So Deborah was really remarkable. She was the only masterless woman in Middleborough who was not a widow and she supported herself for the next few years and, and managed to scrape a living. But in the spring of 1782, General George Washington put out a call for new recruits, what were called three years men. It was a three-year term of service. It was the very end of the Revolutionary War. Most of the men in Middleborough and across Massachusetts had already served. Most of them had served in town militia or state militia and had no interest in signing on for the national army. They were very skeptical of this centralized national government. Um, and so the town of Middleborough couldn't raise any recruits that spring. And Deborah sat in Sprout Tavern weaving as the men around her talked about this. What are we going to do? We have to fill our roles. We have to muster this many men. And so they began to offer what was called a bounty. It was basically a bonus, a signing bonus. And it got up to 20 pounds of silver if any man would sign on. 20 pounds of silver was a lot of money. And so Deborah went to a house where she knew a, a maid servant um, and got that servant to help her steal some men's clothing from the household. She tucked her hair under a cap. She marched down to the recruiting office at a local lawyer's and signed on under the name of Timothy Thayer, pocketed the bounty and went about her way. Unfortunately for Deborah, uh, somebody spied her in that uh, signing office, and Deborah had a uh, uh, was left-handed, and she had a an injury on one of her fingers that didn't allow her to bend it, and it was quite visible when she was holding a quill or when she was weaving. So people knew about this injury, um, and somebody saw that and said, "I think that's Deborah," and uh, immediately sent out uh, word that she had done this. Um, she was apprehended, she confessed, she returned the bounty, and then they said, "We're not done with you." we're gonna get the constable and we're gonna put you under arrest. Um, and they were gonna arrest her because uh, quote unquote, male impersonation was a crime in Massachusetts. A woman could not wear men's clothing and could not claim to be a man. Um, and so she uh, quickly hightailed it. <laughs> she stole a different set of men's clothes, cut her hair short and began to go all, oops, I'm gonna skip these slides, began to go all over um, the, the state of Massachusetts. Um, if we start here in the town of Middleborough, she went down to uh, what is now New Bedford, thought about signing on a ship, uh, got her first glimpse of the ocean and decided, nope, <laughs> not for me. She went all the way up to Boston, that's the green line, um, and looked at signing on as a weaver's um, assistant or apprentice, but the town was flooded with young men back from the war. And then she went all around along where this red line is, in fact, she stopped at some towns that I saw in the chat. We know she stopped at Dedham, for instance. Um, and she eventually ended up in the towns of Uxbridge and Bellingham. And there they were offering 60 pounds sterling as a signing bonus. She signed on under the name of Robert Shirtliff. Um, and she was told, muster up in Worcester. And so she walked all the way to Worcester. And there she fell in with a company of young men who began the march to West Point. Now, can you imagine this? She's 22 years old. She's a young woman. She's been in household service and weaving for her entire life. She's never really left this area of Middleborough and Plimpton where she grew up. Uh, she's certainly never been alone and unsupervised like this. It was illegal for a woman to walk along a road without a chaperone. So the freedom to travel, the freedom to go to a new town, to live as a different person must have been intoxicating. And it must have been utterly terrifying to be in a group of strange men and to be effectively in disguise. She gets to West Point. Um, they put the regiment, uh, sorry, the company through um, a bunch of exercises um, and they select Deborah for the light infantry. The light infantry are the crack troops, the best of the best um, in the Revolutionary War. And, and there's often met with skepticism. Some people doubted her record when she said she was part of the light infantry. But at this point in the war, they, they don't have many recruits. And there were two very stringent requirements to be selected for the light infantry. One, you had to be tall. You can see on this fellow that um, he's got a uh, musket that goes to his shoulder. You had to be able to draw your ramrod and load your musket. So that meant you had to be at least five, six. Deborah was five, seven. 
uh, very tall for a woman and fairly tall for a man. And you had to have teeth. You had to have teeth because your shot and cartridge were packed in paper or parchment and you would tear it open. So if you didn't have enough teeth in the right places, you couldn't load your rifle. So that's why Deborah was picked for the light infantry. Um, and I, I share this image because it's this is the typical uniform and gear that a light infantryman would, would carry. Um, and probably uh, they were only issued one set of, uh, of a uniform. And this probably helped Deborah a good deal. Um, they weren't expected to change. Um, they weren't expected to bathe uh, that often. Uh, Deborah served for a year and a half. And in that time, she said they were forced to bathe two or three times. Um, so all of these factors would have helped her maintain her disguise. And I call it a disguise, but in fact, I would say that at some point in her service, she fully became Bob Shirtliff. She was known as by the nickname of Bob. Um, and why do I say that? Because she served for a year and a half um, with a small company of men in an active theater of war. The British held Manhattan, um, and they would do these little uh, raiding parties up the Hudson River, um, and they would try to raid the harvest. They would try to catch horses. Um, they would try to burn farms. It was a campaign of terror to a degree, but also they were trying to capitalize on, on the supplies that they could capture. And Deborah um, was one of a, a handful of smaller groups that patrolled and put down these little raiding parties. So she saw live fire, she was injured and, um, and definitely took, took shots and gave them as they say. Um, but in some ways, the most remarkable part of her uh, service is told in this story, in this picture. Um, this is New Windsor, the final winter cantonment of the Revolutionary War. Washington withdrew his troops up the Hudson. He was in Newburgh, where his headquarters were, and just down the road from Newburgh, he uh, ordered a winter cantonment at New Windsor. And the first thing all the men did was they felled a bunch of trees and they built these cabins. Originally, it would have had a stone uh, chimney at each end with a fireplace inside. 16 men lived in this cabin for three or four months of winter, and the snow was over four feet high. They had a chamber pot inside, um, and they were expected to entertain themselves. Can you imagine 22 year old young woman living with these men for four months of winter? This is why I think it was more than a disguise. This is why I think Deborah became Bob Shirtliff. Um, every record of service indicates that Bob Shirtliff was an, an exceptional soldier um, and uh, received praise and medals and commendations and even a promotion. Um, so, remarkable. And this was the story that I heard um, from my grandmother when I was really little. Um, we would pick her up. She lived outside of uh, Boston. And we would pick her up to go to the reenactments of the battles of Lexington and Concord on Patriots Day. And she would tell me a very condensed version of Deborah's story. She would say, oh, you had an ancestor who so loved her country that she wanted to sign on and serve it. And she'd watched the boys march away from town and she wanted to be like them. And so she signed on to be a soldier too. And at at four, five, six years old, I felt that truth. I wanted to be like the boys around me as well. And when I did this research for this paper back in high school, I felt this immediate connection to Deborah. Um, I felt this sense of she wanted to be free. She wanted to be who she was. And she had the courage to do it at the risk of everything. And I don't draw any direct lines. I don't think because I knew this story and my ancestor had done this in 1782, I thought I could do something similar. But what I do know is just after my junior year in high school, I spent the summer in Boston. And for the first time in my life, I went to a youth group um, for gay youth. And I went there and met other um, gay and lesbian youth. And on the third or fourth meeting, uh, the, the topic was transgender identity. And in 1995, the word transgender was brand new. But a young transgender person said a very simple thing. He said, being transgender just means you were born as one gender, but you never felt that was right. You always felt like you were something or someone else. And I was like, oh my gosh, you just told my life story in one sentence. And I asked myself, what, what do I do? <laughs> what do I do? I've always felt like a boy. And I talked to this young person and he said, well, you live as you're supposed to live. You live as who you are. And I thought of Deborah Sampson at that moment. I said, yeah, that's what she did. <laughs> um, and in short order, I came up and transitioned. 
I cut my hair short. I asked people to call me Alex. I started using he, him. Um, and I went back for my senior year at boarding school wearing a jacket and tie that was boys dress code at the time. I was probably the only boy who was really happy about that. Um, and I began my life as a boy, as what I'd always understood myself to be. Um, and it was difficult. It was not without challenges. Um, a lot of people questioned what I was doing and why I was doing it. Again, 1995, transgender was brand new. I had to explain myself over and over and over again. But you can tell from the smile on my face, it was also wonderful. It was how I had always felt. And finally, the world saw me as I saw myself. Um, and so when I went back to do this research on Deborah. Um, as an adult, as someone who had lived as a transgender person for a oh boy, almost 20 years by the time I wrote this novel and did this research, um, I, had, I brought to it a lot of experience of what it would feel like to pass as um, the other gender um, and to live that life and, and ask those questions and have those doubts. And it made me go back to Deborah's story with an entirely different lens than when I had first encountered it. This is a a uh, statue of Deborah that stands in front of the Sharon Public Library. Um, and the ending of Deborah's story is a curious one. She served for a year and a half, and after she spent the winter at New Windsor, um, the army moved back to West Point. And then very quickly, um, after, after re-garrisoning garrisoning West Point, uh, they were called down to Philadelphia to put down a mutiny. And at the end of the Revolutionary War, a lot of soldiers mutinied. Um, because they hadn't been paid and they'd been promised back pay and they hadn't received any. Um, and so all of West Point went down to Philadelphia, um, put down a mutiny of the Pennsylvania line. And there the mutiny was, was quelled very quickly, but Deborah fell ill with a fever um, and was taken to a hospital in the city of Philadelphia, an army hospital. Um, and there a doctor examined her um, when she had fallen unconscious um, and opened up her shirt and saw that she was female bodied. And this doctor was named, I love his name, his name is Dr. Barnabas Binney, and he took her home uh, to his private residence, and he and his wife nursed her back to health. Again, remarkable that he would choose to do this um, at a time when it, what she was doing was very much illegal and would have been viewed by many as immoral. But Dr. Binney nursed her back to health, and when she was well again, um, he offered her a choice. He said, I have here um, a address and I'll give you some money and you can resume your life as a woman if that's what you want. But I also have your uniform and um, you can resume your life as a soldier if you want. Um, and, and he told her that in the time that she had lain ill in his house, many of her fellow soldiers, including um, her commanding officers, had come by to inquire, how's Bob? Is Bob going to be up and about? We need Bob back. And um, they were really curious about how he was doing. And Deborah said, I'd like my uniform back. And Dr. Benny gave it to her and said, I'm, I'm going to write you a letter. And the letter is going to be something that you can give to your officers if you want to. And it'll explain that you're a woman um, and of noble character and et cetera, et cetera. And he said, I think, I think they would be proud of you. And she carried that letter with her um, from what we can tell for a few weeks, maybe as much as a month as she returned to West Point. And then she gave it to General Patterson, her commanding officer. And Patterson was stunned into disbelief, didn't believe that she was actually a woman. Um, and then again, he did something truly remarkable. He kept her on as a soldier. He said, okay, that's fine. <laughs> um, and soon after that, within the next month or two, uh, Washington ordered uh, West Point to be degarrisoned and all the soldiers sent home. Um, they were very afraid of mutiny. And so the soldiers were marched back to their hometowns and many were remanded to the care of either a wife or a mother and told, don't let your, <laughs> your man rebel. Uh, Deborah did not want to go back to her mother. Understandable, if your mom had sold you into indentured servitude, you might be a little bitter too. So she ended up at the home of her aunt in Sharon. Um, and there she said she was her brother, Ephraim Sampson. Um, and her aunt believed her. And from what we can tell, the town of Sharon did as well, maybe for the next six months, until someone noticed that there was another Ephraim Sampson living a few towns over. And Deborah had to admit that she was not really a Friam, she was Deborah, and she resumed her life as a woman. Um, this was really hard for me to write <laughs> as an author. I wanted her to be free. I wanted her to continue living as a man. I wanted her to be able to be who she thought she was. Um, but the truth is that she resumed life as a woman, married, had children, um, was a quite impoverished uh, wife and mother, 
Um, her husband had a very small, meager farm. And then she had the idea that she could earn some money by telling her story. So she wrote a, what we would call now an as told to memoir. And then she went on the road. She became America's first traveling woman lecturer. And she did this because she had to petition uh, first the U.S., uh, sorry, first the Massachusetts House and then the U.S. House to get her military pension. And in doing that, she collected her, her um, account um, and got a sense of this is a story that people are interested in. She won her pension. Um, it was not much. It was a couple dollars a month. She becomes America's first woman military veteran to earn a pension for her service. Um, and so uh, she took this story and she went on the road and this is what she would do. She would get up on stage in her dress and she would talk about being um, a, a virtuous woman, a mother, a wife, a true patriot who wanted to serve and she would talk about her service. And oftentimes she could hear the laughter and the disbelief from the audience as this middle-aged woman is standing there telling about being a soldier. So she'd go backstage, put on her old uniform, get her old musket, and then do this. This is the military drill, um, sort of the shoulder arms, present arms. It was what she would have been drilled in at West Point. And she would do that right on stage to prove to them that even though she was a woman and a wife and a mother, she was also still a soldier and she was just as capable as the, as the men. So really a remarkable person um, who, who never stopped asserting her capabilities, her desire to determine her own destiny at a time when that was really not something that women were allowed to or legally capable uh, of doing. Um, so to say that she influenced me profoundly is, is an understatement. Um, and in writing this story, uh, it was a real struggle to tell it authentically for her time, not let too much of my own story come in. Um, but it imbued me with a huge sense of gratitude to be able to tell her tale and to be able to compare my life to hers. Um, I've been so fortunate um, to have a word like transgender um, to be able to live as who I am and be my authentic self, to have supportive family and supportive friends, um, and really to live life as an as an as an average person. Um, all of the things I think that Deborah would have loved to have been able to do, but the understandings of gender um, and of what women were allowed to do prevented her from doing that. Um, and in my own life, I've just had the chance to tell such amazing stories and to be able to look at the past and understand what gender was like for people uh, back then, uh, cisgender women uh, and people like Deborah, who I would, I would explain as transgender, um, lived such uh, profoundly difficult, complicated lives, um, and oftentimes their stories don't get told. So it has been a real gift to be able to tell that and to share it um, with you. Um, so I'm going to pause here and see if there are any questions. And again, in webinar mode, you can put them in through the Q&A, um, and I will um, happily answer them. Great. Thank you so much. It's fascinating. I mean, both um, both lines, your own story as well as Deborah's. I'm curious about, um, as I wait for people to put questions in the Q&A, um, the cover of your book, she's in a dress. So what, what was the thinking there? Um, so this was my debut novel, and my agent said about debut novels, you get to have one major hissy fit and two minor hissy fits, and that's it. They won't. You're not. You're not a bestseller, so don't push your luck. <laughs> and she, her recommendation was save your hissy fit for the cover. Um, so I didn't mind the cover. Um, it has many elements that I liked. Um, she was a, a weaver, and she does a lot of sewing, and so I love the stitches. There's a lot of nice. Um, divisions where things are split kind of in half, but they're also united. And that to me is a theme of the book. But the image itself is not an image of Deborah. It's of a French soldier who served later. And so it's completely anachronistic. Um, and the, uh, the, the firearm, for instance, a handgun that she's holding on right. the cover was never something that Deborah would have used. Deborah would have used a musket um, and not had access to a sidearm, which were um, notably unreliable um, back then, uh, very hard to aim and would never have been issued to a foot soldier. Um, and, and But they liked this image at Simon & Schuster, principally because when you fold the, the book um, and it's, it's closed, the front folds in such a way that it looks like she could be wearing pants and then you open it up and it looks like a dress. So they liked that element. Um, I did not, I pitched a minor hissy fit. I didn't pitch a major hissy fit. And I said, um, I really think it's wrong to put 
a historically inaccurate image on a historical fiction novel. And they said, okay, thanks for the input. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I hear you. Um, so Linda asked, well, first says amazing story. Thank you for sharing yours and Deborah's. Do you know of any other women who did this in American history? Oh, so many, so many. Um, and I love to do presentations on sort of the hidden uh, transgender history. Um, in fact, Deborah was probably inspired by um, a woman named Hannah Snell, who, who, uh, whose biography was well circulated in the American colonies. And Hannah Snell was British, um, but had joined the um, Royal Navy as a, as a, as a Marine mm -hmm. uh, and served for six months. And, and her story was quite different from Deborah's. She had an abusive husband, and of course, women couldn't choose to divorce. Men were the only ones who could enact divorce. And so Hannah Snell um, ran away from home, and her husband pursued her. And the only way she could figure out to put enough distance between her and her husband was to get on a boat. And the only way she could do that was in disguise as a man. And so she signed on as a Marine, sailed around England, disembarked, and resumed her life. So Deborah would have read that story. It was very popular. Um, we know of a couple other women in the Revolutionary War who disguised themselves as men. Most of them were discovered within a day or two. Some of them were fined and imprisoned. Some of them were uh, subject to public humiliation rituals. It was called being drummed out. Um, you would walk a gauntlet of drummers, and uh, it was a kind of public shaming. And most of them were accused of um, prostitution. That's what the crime was asserted to be. Um, by the time of the American Civil War, uh, we have dozens of reliable stories of, of women disguising themselves as men. Some of those women disguised themselves as men, fought in the Civil War, were following sweethearts um, and, and resumed life as women. And importantly, many of those people served as men and then continued living as men afterwards. And that was possible for them in a way that it wasn't for Deborah because of things like the railroad and immigration. And there were a lot more people moving around the country a lot more. Um, in Deborah's time, if you can imagine and think of that map that I showed you, if you grew up in Middleborough, you stayed in Middleborough, um, you might go to Taunton once in your life. Um, you may never go to Boston, right? Um, and so when a stranger appears in Bellingham and Uxbridge, you bet everybody's asking, who are you? Where are you from? Do I know your people? By the time of the Civil War, there's no more of that. There's train loads of immigrants coming in. So these, these probably transgender you know, people could uh, start a new life um, and, and be able to do that. So there's, there's dozens and dozens of wonderful uh, stories out there. We're going to have to have you back for that talk because I'm... <laughs> I'm actually super curious. So um, did she walk that whole way from Plimpton down and then up and then across to Uxbridge? She walked, right? She walked and um, a reminder that um, shoes did not have arches back then. Um, so 150 miles she probably put in before marching from Worcester to West Point, all on foot. Um, conveyances at the time would be very limited. There was a stagecoach that ran. Um, it was very expensive. Um, and uh, again, um, she would have been subject to scrutiny in the confines of a stagecoach. Um, and so walking um, allowed her to hide when she needed to um, and, and travel um, kind of privately. Patricia asks if, Deb if Deborah was black or white. Uh, Deborah is white. Um, and uh, she there were people of color. There were both indigenous people and black people living in Middleborough um, at the time. And we know that one of her best friends, um, a woman with whom she often shared a room and, and probably a bed because you would put two or three people in a bed at the time, um, was J named Jenny Whitcomb. And, and Jenny uh, was the daughter of a freed slave. Um, and, and she and Deborah were, were good friends. And one of Deborah's um, laments of, uh, of small town life and particularly um, as a servant, was how separate they were from everybody else. And she speaks about the congregational um, church in Middleborough. And she would say, you know, you'd go in there to worship, right? And the rich people would be up front in the nice pews. The poor people would be in back in the not so nice pews. The male servants would be in the first balcony. The female servants would be in the second balcony. And the servants of color would be in the third balcony. And she, uh, she said, you know, what... What, what is this world that this is how we have to appear before God? Um, mm -hmm. And uh, she, she was, a, she was a, a woman with, with strong opinions and complicated opinions for her time around um, gender for sure, 
class for sure. And from what small um, information we have seems to, to have those feelings around race as well. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess I, my thought is that people are people throughout history and time and places. Um, it's just a matter of how, what their opportunities and resources are, um, if they can get that out in the world. So um, Gretchen says, thank you for sharing. Fascinating story. Uh, she's curious to, to know about Deborah's family. How did they react to her, to her amazing past as a soldier? Um, very interesting. Um, Deborah's mother, unsurprisingly, um, came by not long after Deborah um, resumed life as a woman and, and was 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 around um, to ask for money. <laughs> um, Deborah and her mom had a had a very difficult relationship throughout Deborah's life, and every time Deborah received some windfall, whether that was her pension or publishing this memoir, Deborah's mom would show up with her handout. Um, and and I think Deborah's. Um, desire for freedom really came from a desire to be financially independent in some way. Um, her aunt um, and brothers uh, seemed to have been very supportive of her. Um, and in general, the town of, uh, she moved eventually with her husband to Stoughton, Massachusetts, which is kind of next to Sharon. Um, and the town referred to her as the old soldier. Um, and I, I love that. And she would often wear her uniform jacket when she was out plowing and working in the fields. And people would bring their children by and would say, oh, Mrs. Gannett, will you tell the story of you being a soldier? Um, and so she was sort of a local curiosity. Um, and that to me is, is part of a great New England uh, tradition of tolerating the eccentric people that you, <laughs> that you live in in small town life um, and valuing them for who they are. Um, and so she was really uh, celebrated in, in many ways um, and, and tragically um, lived a very difficult adult life. Um, she was, uh, as I say, very poor. Uh, she had been injured in the line of duty and those injuries Im impaired her um, function, functionality and ability for the rest of her life. She predeceased her husband, um, which gives us the nice uh, first, uh, he becomes the first man to earn a military pension because of his wife's service, which I think is pretty cool. Yeah. Um, but to, to emphasize how, how poor they were, she was buried in an unmarked grave. Um, and it was not until uh, in a century later that the Daughters of the American Revolution were able to fundraise to, to um, give her a grave marker. Um, mm -hmm. So she uh, was well liked, um, but certainly there was a, it was a, very tough existence. Mm -hmm. So Marion, who is from Watertown and with the Daughters of the American Revolution, asks, um, did she leave any diaries or letters? Oh, I wish. <laughs> um, she left um, what would have been called her, her um, day book, um, which is a, really a record of um, household expenses. Um, it, she left her wedding dress, which the Massachusetts Historical Society has preserved. Um, and there's a, one piece of furniture that um, has been passed down through her descendants. Um, and I gave a talk in the Portland Public Library in Portland, Maine, and somebody claiming also to be a descendant of Deborah brought what they claimed to be her musket to that talk. Um, it was not allowed into the library, thank goodness, um, and I have no way of verifying it, but that is another artifact that may or may not be out there. Um, and the day book is interesting. It records uh, what she spent money on and where money came from um, and gives us a sense of, of how she thought of the, of the world. Um, but by far the most telling artifact is the wedding dress. And it is a, it is a, print, uh, a print fabric, so not expensive. Um, and she uh, stitched it herself for her wedding. And you can see, if you, if you look at it, um, you can see no fewer than seven different refittings of this uh, to let the waist out, to pleat it, to, to, to raise the neckline, to lower the neckline. And what she's doing is over the course of her life, she's taking the one nice dress she has and she's fitting it to the current style, empire waist, low waist, full skirt. And so that to me speaks volumes to her poverty, but also um, her desire to look good. Mm -hmm. And her resourcefulness. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, you know? self-reliant. <laughs> so Martin says, great presentation. Um, he is reading A Girl Called Samson by Amy Harmon. Um, then found some Googling to find other books about the topic. What differences are there between these other books that might illuminate why there are several renditions of De Deborah's story? 
Yeah, when I wrote my book um, in 2014, um, there were two young adult novels out. Um, one was called Soldier's Secret and the other one was called The Secret Soldier. Mm -hmm. I needed to coordinate those titles a little bit better. Um, and I think for a while, Deborah Sampson was popular in the same way that like Molly Pitcher was popular. Um, oh, this plucky young woman who's just like out there with the men. And if you just peel back that story a little bit, you're like, wait a second. And Molly Pitcher too. What the heck is a woman doing on the battlefield, right? What mm -hmm. is she doing there? How'd she get there? What was her life like? Um, and the, the the book that was just mentioned in that question, um, I have not read it. I've read a synopsis of it. Um, it takes the other line that that is often taken with um, with Deborah and with other women who who disguise themselves and serve in the military. And it's often a romantic story. Oh, they're doing it and they fall in love. And I'm like, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you don't live as a man for a year and a half um, just to get the guy. Um, that that seems to me to be overly complicated. Um, so uh, I, I think there's a lot of different versions because people come to this story with a really um, important question. How'd she do it? Why'd she do it? And, um, and what was driving her, right? What was her motive? Um, and, and I think uh, different authors have different takes on that. Um, and and we, we'll never know. That's the fun of being a fiction writer is filling in the gaps that are, that are um, unknowable. And, and so it's always fun to read somebody else's take and say, huh, I, that's not what I imagined. Um, or that's so cool. I never would have thought of that. Mm -hmm. I'm curious about um, the part where you said that they lived in for four months in that one room sh shack, I'll call it, <laughs> um, as it, it through the winter. Is there any information about how she was able to keep her identity secret within such tight quarters? Yeah, um, she seems to have volunteered for every mission that was uh, possible. <laughs> In other words, she got out as much as she could. Um, mm -hmm. So she was the person who would say, oh, you need someone to walk to the next um, camp to deliver a message? Me, please, I'll do that. You need someone to go um, uh, track down those footprints in the snow that we're not sure who made them? Me, please, I'll go do that. Um, she was very pious. She went to a lot of church services. She seems to have taken any excuse to get out of that cabin, probably to cover things like going to the bathroom because she wasn't going to use the chamber pot, um, probably to um, avoid scrutiny and having to sit for lengthy periods of time. Um, and, and she seems to have just been a, a very competent, reliable soldier. Mm -hmm. Well, no wonder the other soldiers loved her. I mean, she did everything, right? <laughs> right, exactly. Midnight guard duty, no problem, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, Maxwell asks, um, it's sort of about the rabbit hole because you already talked about diaries and written versions and things like that. But what what, what did you use for research, either primary sources or more reliable sources to get the story? Mm. Yeah, um, I read uh, other soldiers' um, accounts um, that were written contemporaneous to Deborah mm -hmm. um, to give me a flavor of what life was like. Um, and one of the other bits of research that I did was I tried to find what she would have read. Um, she, we know she was an avid reader. Um, and so I, I read the, a lot of newspapers, almanacs from the time, and also literature to get a sense of what her worldview would have been. I tried to, 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 to really feel what was the language used around her, what were the, the metaphors and conceptual framework she would have had. Um, and uh, that was really helpful. Um, a historian named Alfred Young uh, wrote a monograph called Masquerade about Deborah. And so he had done a lot of um, research. And I got to, um, once Simon & Schuster bought my manuscript, um, I got to work with um, Professor Young um, and talk to him about his research. And he walked me through some very obscure uh, primary sources that were super, super helpful. So he had done all the ar archival stuff, which saved me a lot of time. <laughs> <laughs> Did you get to visit some of the places? I know you went to Middleborough and saw the little outhouse that's still there, but did you get to go to any other places that she had been through? I went to um, New Windsor as well. Um, and other than that, it's a little bit hard to tell uh, where she went. Um, she says she was wounded in a skirmish near Terrytown. Um, mm -hmm. Terrytown, New York, um, doesn't have a lot of landmarks for much of anything from the revolutionary era, particularly a, a small skirmish. Um, you would never know that the British had occupied Manhattan, um, you know, for years at the end of the war. Um, and other places where she lived, um, 
her house in Stoughton that she lived in is still there. Um, and uh, you can see it. Um, it's been moved from where it was when she lived in it and, and modified, I should say, rather than moved. Um, so the chimneys have been moved. Um, and, and other than that, there's not a lot of traces of, of where she was. Wow. Um, Meredith says she has the limited edition of Female Review, The Life of Deborah Sampson. That's yes. cool. Yeah, um, that is the um, As Told To memoir that she wrote. Um, so she wrote that with a ghostwriter. Um, and it is a, a good example of very flowery language. It's also um, not a great historical source, uh, probably about as fictional as my novel is, but interesting. Well, Gretchen asks, why did you decide to make this a, a fiction novel versus a nonfiction? Yeah, um, I love writing fiction because everybody's life even somebody as well recorded as Abraham Lincoln, who's who you know can you can account minute for minute for his life and on many days, um, there are these little gaps, right? There are these little sort of like lacunae, and you can insert a story into that and say, what would happen if? And so Deborah's story was perfect for that. We know just enough and can prove just enough. Her name appears here. There's a record of this there that we can trace these little dots. And the fun of fiction is to connect those dots um, and and to say. I want to get to know this character, right? And there's no way to do it except through imagination. I want to get to know her and I want to be able to ask that question. What would she do? Why would she do it? That to me is the fiction writer's job and pleasure. Um, and so finding those little gaps and, and allowing my imagination to, to run free is, uh, is really delightful um, and, and much more to me enlivening um, and engaging than, than um, the research, which I enjoy, but um, is not the end of it for me. Mm -hmm. Have you always known you were going to be a writer? No, not at all. Um, I didn't think I was going to be an English teacher. And then I, when I ended up as an English teacher, um, I was trying to redesign my writing curriculum um, one summer because I wasn't happy with how I, how I was teaching kids to write. And so I, I came up with a bunch of writing exercises and I started to do them myself to see how long would this take? What would it feel like? And in doing that, I was like, this is really fun. <laughs> um, and so I started writing along with my students um, and first wrote a lot of essays and short stories and then gradually said, I, I really like this. I want to do something longer form and wrote this novel. Mm -hmm. Do you think that you would have written about Deborah? A couple of reasons, things. One, if she wasn't your ancestor and mm -hmm. two, if you weren't your transgender yourself. I probably would have gravitated to her story even if I hadn't been related to her. Although I admit Part of why I, I wrote with her was wrote about her was that I'd already felt like I'd spent a lot of time with her mm -hmm. um, and I had thought about her. So she was kind of present with me for a lot of my life. Um, and I don't think I would have written about her if I weren't um, trans. Um, and that's because I think, well, I have written, well, I have read rather many good books about transgender characters written by people who are not transgender. Um, I think. Uh, for me to give her voice authenticity, um, my lived experience was really relevant. Mm -hmm. It sounds like it. It makes it much more relatable in so many ways, too. Um, Marianne asks, what happened to her children? What happened to her children? Um, she had three children of her own with Benjamin Gannett. Um, and then she adopted at least one and maybe two others. Um, and she did that even though she was poor. And I think, you know, you know, trying to understand her motive, um, I think she did, did that adoption because she had been put out as a younger child. And I think she really wanted to um, nurture and, and, and provide family um, for poor young, young kids. Mm -hmm. um, her offspring mostly stayed in the area for several generations. Um, at least one of them uh, remained living in the house for the next um, sort of, uh, I want to say, 50 years. It stayed in the family for a while. Um, and there are many, many, many people who can trace back to Deborah still living um, in, in New England. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know that any of her children um, went on to do anything uh, particularly notable or remarkable, um, but certainly lived in town um, mm -hmm. and, and stayed around in the area. Well, they lived, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so Maddie says, wonderful presentation. Thank you for sharing your stories. 
um, is your novel available for purchase and where is the best place to get it? I love that question. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> yeah. um, you absolutely can uh, get it anywhere um, online. Um, if that's your shopping preference, um, support your local bookstore um, as well. They can order it for you if they don't have it um, on the shelves. I think the library can, can loan you a copy too. Um, I've written uh, three other novels and a nonfiction book too, if you, if you find yourself liking my writing style. So um, have that. Okay. So is there any place that you can get signed books from you, Alex? Like, do you have a oh. website or... If you, I have a, I have a website and if you email me through my website and give me your mailing address, I will sign a, a very nice book plate and mail it to you. And you can put my signature in your uh, book. Perfect. Thank you. And Barb's going to ask my last question, which is what are you working on now? <laughs> um, I just actually finished a manuscript of a prep school murder mystery. Um, <laughs> So completely different genre. It was a heck of a lot of fun to write. Um, and I will uh, see if that picks up a publisher. Well, we'll look forward to that. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for this whole conversation. It's been fascinating. And um, in a long time coming, like I said, we've been I've been looking forward to this for four years or three years. <laughs> yes. Well, thanks for inviting me. And thanks to the, for great questions from the audience. And um, have a good 4th of July. Yeah. Everybody, happy Independence Day. Bye, Alex. Have a good night. Right. You too. Thank you.